What's up, readers and writers? This is Brooke Hennon here with Breaking Down the Page, here to talk about writing and reading and all those fun things. And today, we're going to talk about a little bit of gardener versus architect writing, but we're going to really get into, for me, what it looks like as a gardener and what are the breakdowns. How do I just kind of like break down scenes and get into those? Because I don't really plot ahead, at least in the project I'm doing. I'm 40,000 words in. I mean, I, like, I kind of have the next objective for the person that, uh, for Yami, the character, but I don't know what's going to happen after that. I am very much exploring the story and I'm purposefully trying to not think about what happens next before I sit down to write. Like I have some ideas, but if I think about stuff too much, I, as, as excited as I might be when I'm coming up with those ideas, they don't excite me nearly as much when I sit down as cool as I think they might actually be. And I don't know if that's just, or a bipolar thing, or an ADHD thing, and I'll just find something else that takes my attention and go that direction. This is something that I've just learned to do. I told too much about <laughs> some people recently about what I'm working on. Now I'm just kind of like, I oh, don't know. They really liked it, but it's not as exciting now that I've told people about it already. <laughs> and so I purposely will try to like just not tell people. Uh, but there is an element of when you're talking with people and you're you're writing, or if you're doing stand-up, any sort of that, you know, you there is an element of testing some ideas on audiences, and audiences definitely like stuff. The issue is me just getting excited about it again. And I've just had a bunch of extra stressors this week that have kind of helped me not do that. Right now I'm planning to do 10,000 words in a day. The most I've ever done in a day is 6,000 words. And that was a few years back when I was doing a writing challenge. My goal is to have 55000 by the 5th, but I'm doing an all-day trip down to the capital of Illinois. going to be my first time doing tour guide stuff on a bus. It's going to be exciting. So I'm like, I have that in my brain. So I talked with my wife. We're just going to set stuff aside so I can do 10K. I'm at 42000 pretty much. If I don't get the words in today, I'll at least get them in tomorrow. I just want to have fun writing and coming up with original stories. And so, like I said, I'm a gardener versus someone like Brandon Sanderson. I would have to assume Oda from One Piece is an architect. He has much larger ideas kind of plotted out ahead of time. Um, this probably is just a bad illustration. <laughs> but I was quickly just trying to think of, like, what's the difference between the two? And what we have here, <laughs> I jokingly put, we have pre-plotted. So we have, like, here's our main plots. And we have a sense that some of the plots don't start till later in the story. Then we're going to have some that it's like, oh, now we're going to pick up on this. Or, oh, now we're going to start this plot over here. Whereas me, I'm kind of joking pre-potted, because Gardner. And it's like, let's say I kind of have maybe four plot ideas, if I even have that many when I start. I might not necessarily, like, I have to sit down and write through the scenes. Is the, I don't know if it's just a conceptual thing. It's when I, when I sit down to draw stuff. Man, I can have an awesome idea in my head, and then when I sit down to draw, despite knowing anatomy and this stuff, I just can't materialize it the way that I need to to be able to draw it. And I feel that way about plotting a lot of the time. It's very much I have to come up with a specific scene, and I have to write through that scene and see what characters do. As much as I kind of know where characters go, but there's this element of like, well, will the characters surprise me? And I'm sure that there's a bit too much of a uniformity to my characters and what they think about because uh, I haven't plotted directions, but it's a big thing is about knowing character motivation. We're going to get into that. But for me, it's like, I need to have all these question marks for me to like, oh, I can I can go play over here. I can do that. Not to say you can't have a measure of this if you're like an architect. Like if you're an architect, and I think Brandon Sanderson talks about this, it's like you have to make changes to your to some of your stuff as you're going, but some people really like to know where they're going uh, to get to the end of the book. George R. R. Martin. He talks about he's more of a gardener, or a planter, I think is the other term. Where he just kind of comes up with characters and just kind of lets them gestate over here and we don't see them. And that's very clear in his chapters in Game of Thrones, where it's very specific characters and we kind of bounce through them and we don't might not circle back to a story arc for 100 pages or something. So, for me... What do I focus on then? For me, I focus on, I have very specific tasks that I go through in scenes. A lot of this comes from writing from start to finish by John Schultz. 
He was my uh, pedagogical thesis advisor and I was at Columbia College Chicago in the master's program for teaching of writing combined with the MA of uh, MFA creative writing. So in a lot of what I'm about to show, at least some of it comes out of these early pages. I, I'm going to try to post some screenshots. Oh, also make sure you like and subscribe. And I have posts to my Substack. I'm starting to post the chapters for the stuff I'm currently working on. If you want to see what are the rough drafts of this Brook dude look like, you can now see them. I have chapter one is up in my Substack. There'll be a link below as well as to my locals. If you have any fiction you want feedback on or want to talk fiction, your own stuff, love to see you post on locals. I'd love to be able to uh, give some feedback, read it, have fun and cr create a community there. I'm now getting into a open mic here in the Chicago area. I went to one last night and got invited to participate in the reading in future weeks. It was uh, hosted by student organization at Columbia College Chicago, my alma mater, but I didn't want to, it's the end of the semester, I didn't want to step in on the toes of those seniors. We wanted to, wife and I both went, we wanted to get to hear the seniors present their stuff, but then there was a bunch of people that weren't seniors that were presenting stuff, and I was like, all right, so this is a community thing. Cool. So, we got, oh, I was going to keep this here, so not to distract you people with everything else. So, a lot of people say that they're not into, they there, I'm, a, I'm an actuary. I don't know anything about writing. And I, I tend to think about writing and mathematical equations to a degree. I don't always look within that framework, but in that framework, we pretty much have idea equals chapter, chapters, what, you know, chapter plus chapters equals what's actually on the writing, what's on the page is the goal. You want these three things to kind of match. But what what goes into it doesn't do it. It could be a short story. I just put chapters. But within chapters, we have subsections. So we have scenes plus scenes turn into a chapter. Or you could have just like I've been writing. It's like oh wow, I have a two thousand word scene. Should I break this up into chapters? I'm not entirely sure. That's a stylistic choice. And if there's any editors out there or uh, agents, hit me up. I've been posting my own stuff, but I just wanted to toss it. If you're just like, this guy seems like he might kind of have an idea of what he's doing, but I haven't seen the writing. So then that's made up by your characters. And you're going to have, like, locations. And so we're going to go through the character side. So what? What when we think of what plus what equals character, we got... And this isn't totally extensive. This is just off the top of my head. We got motiv motivation, which would be non-physical things. What are non-physical things about the character? What do they want? And also, the measure of kind of who you are as a quality writer is not to just info dump all the things I'm going to go through. The The goal is to mix them, of course, all together. So you're not just dumping all the location or all the character motivation. There's a sense of, yes, over time you want to be able to see them head to toe. That's one of the things we're going to get into. We want to be able to see the different identifiers in a location. Are there stairs? Are there tables? We'll get into that. So, picture them head to toe. All right, the physical description. We can have, are they a, a sense of an antagonist versus protagonist? Like a primary versus secondary character? A tertiary character or a surprise character? If you ever just taken a character you never intended to write about and you're just like, you know what, that person right there. You can get some gold out of that. Um, I wouldn't say that it's gold, but the opening section of what I posted is about a Yami is going to do his laundry and I've been to the laundromat the last few weeks a college student might have broken our laundry our laundry machine our washer so we've been going to the local laundromat here in Chicago and I just like had my character going to the laundromat too and I was like wondering you know what's with the lady I noticed the lady checking the that works there the owner and just kind of made a fictional version of a laundromat owner that goes around, checks the lint. What does she do if the character just disappeared? What does she do if anyone leaves clothes there, right? Is there a protocol? What does she think? You know, what are her desires? How does she feel physically? What's it like being around vibrating machines the whole time? Does that affect you? I know I went on a car ride, like eight hours, and we had a speaker. It was, um, and I had it underneath, like, we'd not use, like an actual amplifier underneath and it was just like shaking my elbow for hours. And when I got out of the car, my elbow just hurt for hours. <laughs> I, I feel like because it did something, the, the shaking or whatever did something to my elbow. 
Uh, NPCs versus cannon fodder. Just this off the top of my head. I was like, I'll add that. Just filling up the space with non-character persons, non -per non-person characters or whatever <laughs> NPC stands for. Bartenders, shop owners, people on the street, the sidewalks. Uh, they could potentially be surprise characters you dive into. Versus cannon fodder. That's something I've been having to figure out with my project because I have a lot of. It's very much like a Christian shonen story with s people getting superpowers from angel-like beings and stuff like that. Is is how my fiction rolls? Vigilantes in Chicago fighting human trafficking and whatever, gang violence, gang violence. And I have my boy uh, Yami rolls up on this like temple and he runs into some priests and I started with just two and I was like, you know what? I need to just add a third. That he just, like, kills right off the bat to, like, a, a display of power. So I came up with the dude, got a description, we get him, I set everything up, and he's just like, bam, you're dead. But now I've kind of used a lot of my power, so it's going to be more difficult to take down the other two. But it's one less person to worry about. And then we got, so this is outside of characters, we get style. You get realistic storytelling, very... On the ground, reality, very solid. Versus dreamlike, I utilize a lot of very dreamlike storytelling techniques with my story right now. Such as, what are dreamlike story techniques? Well, what are the things that are in dreams? In dreams, you can have really weird stuff happen that no one seems as weird. Like, it's very, it seems, you know, it doesn't pop you out of the dream. I had a dream a few weeks ago where there was more or less a Terminator Joe Rogan chasing me. Never, I, I it was a dream. I, it never occurred to me that this wasn't real, right? What are other, uh, superpowers can have dreamlike effects on people. People just, they don't, re something supernatural, supernatural is happening. And might be the first time someone's saying something, they may not have a natural, what would be a natural reaction if we saw them in the real world and some of these things can be done to save on time of having reactions of everything. But dream, man, I could make a list of dream, <laughs> what are dreamlike things. Uh, lack of gravity, changing locations very suddenly without people noticing. You turn it in a dream, you can very easily be in the location. I could be in the laundromat, turn around, I'm at the beach. There was no travel but my brain just knows somehow I got there, right? So it just depends on what the style is of the story that you're doing. Uh, you can I have characters with very dreamlike abilities. That's something apparently I go back to where rather than Mystique in the X-Men movies that just changes her physical appearance, I have a character who every time you see him again, he looks like someone else and it affects video cameras and everything. So he... I was, as I started writing the character, this is where I didn't plot stuff. I just had the idea for the character, and then as I was going, I was just like, oh, it'd make a ton of sense that he would just be a CIA agent that can infiltrate any place. Because, and there's the sense of when you see him again, there is a sense of familiarity that you know them and that you're comfortable. It's not like, oh, how did you just get there? I haven't seen you, but where'd the other guy go? No, his power doesn't work that way. His power works that oh, what's up, Bob, you know, or whatever. He might, in the sense, in a dream, you might, there's people that know you that you wouldn't know in the first place, and everything seems natural. I put genre dressing just because to kind of, I think of genre could very much just be window dressing, whether you can have a same dramatical story or comedy, epic, tragedy, set in a Western, you could set it in a high fantasy, low fantasy, urban fantasy, whatever, sci-fi, wherever you want. But there's going to be specific things, and they can go into hard sciences or kind of hard magics or be very much the window dressing rather than, like, more of the larger framework beyond the window. Verbose, and, and I couldn't come up with a better term, but just um, verbose or just might be over-the-top descriptions of things versus just kind of telling the story as it happens versus minimalistic Things you find in minimalistic fiction, oh, I can't ever remember that. <laughs> there was some author in the 80s whose editor, like the guy would come up with short story it, character names for short stories, and the editor would just be like, nah, just, no, it's just a man and a woman. We're good. We're good with that. And paring things down to the, one of the benefits of, potential benefits of going minimalistic is the fewer details you give, um, you can give enough pointers to allow the audience to fill in more of the space, such as in vaudeville, where you have people, or you go to 
uh, Second City here in Chicago, other improv places, and it's like people are on a bench, and the bench can you put a few chairs in a row, you got a bench. You put a few chairs stacked backwards in a few rows, you get a bus, you get a train, and your brain fills in the rest. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff going minimalistic. Parody style would be, I want to write a scene similar to Nabokov. I would say that, or almost an homage would work. It's not a parody making fun of these things. Parody is a larger term of making comparison. Such as, if you want to learn how to paint, you draw a copy of the Mona Lisa, you try to copy it, that would be a parody of that. Of that. Weird Al, known for parodies, he just does them in funny ways. Over here we got... Alright, so now we got our locations. What are we going to do with our locations? How do I, when I, all right, I got characters, I've described them, where are they, what are the, what's around them, so locations, you don't need to add all these things, but these are just things that I go through in my mind, and I add in the details as I need. Quality of light, is it bright, how bright is in the room, how far can you see, can you see your hand, can you see the opposite wall, is it overhead lighting, side lighting, uh, I have characters that are in a tunnel right now. It is an ancient tunnel. There's not enough oxygen in there because it's been buried too long. So it's filled with carbon dioxide, or at least it doesn't have the higher percent, like 14% oxygen or whatever it needs. It doesn't have enough oxygen, so it has more carbon dioxide, methane, and radon, which radon just seeps out of the ground. So the flame is going to be either red for radon or blue for methane and carbon dioxide. So instead of a yellow torch, they're going around the dark, it's a blue torch. And that's going to affect lighting a ton. We got contrasting smells. So, you walk into the street in Chicago, you might get the smell of bagels or donuts from down the street, or burgers from like a local burger place, or you get the smell of the remains that a dog leaves nearby because people don't like to clean up after their pets, or you get just smell of dumpsters. Yeah, so... But getting contrasting smells, all of the things about the location here is just about adding a little more depth to the world, making it a little bit more 3D, right? You don't have to always add them, but it can help. And sometimes you put them directly contrasting, or as a character's moving through space, they smell the different smells at different locations and points in time. Near, middle, far away sound. Same thing here. Living in Chicago, I can hear the the fan on my computer right here, if I'm going to, and there's all exercises that I've been trained to teach with this because it's from John Schultz and Betty Shiflett and from the Columbia College Chicago fiction writing, former fiction writing department. I could, middle sound might be my neighbor downstairs playing super, playing just with mega bass and it, and it, I feel it through the floor. <laughs> I hear it around the apartment. Versus hearing we're not too far from a fire department, about a block and a half, and we hear ambulances and fire trucks go by. It could be the sound of steel beams getting blasted into the ground because there's a construction site. It could be anything. The trash trucks I heard earlier. But filling in the sound, and obviously in fantasy settings, come up with whatever. The sound of the rain, the sound of the wind, rattling metal or rattling plastic. Then we get into objects which could be, generally they're going to be stuff, at least with the, the writing program that I'm from, stuff you can manipulate and move with your hands rel relatively easily, like I got clean Xbox here, I got my cup. Slowly, if I just started adding more objects from my desk, highlighters, paper, you're going to find out more and more about who I am. You go into personal items, watch, wallet. What do characters carry on their person at all time? When they, when they get home, you walk into their apartment or their house with them. What objects are you going to see on what shelves in different places? What's that going to say about them as a character? Nabokov, Chapter 2, King Queen Knave completely wrecks this game with Franz walking around and his, he doesn't, his, his aunt is running him through the apartment and, she, you know, oh, look at all these glass little animals on the shelves and his glasses are broken and he can't see anything. He's just like, what is it? I can't. And so it's very important to her, but for him, it's completely fuzzy. But all those objects said a lot about her and her husband. Get movable objects versus immovable. 
expected versus unexpected objects. So right now you're expecting, I'm at a desk, what if I just pulled out like a Bowie knife? I don't have one, but what if I did? That would probably be, and there's, I could probably pull a lot of things out of nowhere that would, <laughs> would be very unexpected. I think one of those things would be like Chekhov's gun is whatever object, un, unexpected object that you just pull, that you know, that you might, you might put on the shelf early. It could be, and then that built an expectation around it as the story goes. But in general, no one might have expected that there's a, like, why is there a harpoon gun in the corner? And it's like, oh yeah, like, you know, we were fishing, we are down in Florida two weeks ago or whatever. And it's like, oh, okay, like, I guess. <laughs> Indoor versus outdoor objects. We got bikes, you get ladders, uh, moving versus stationary objects. This would be bikes, ladders, cars. Uh, can be the the cars are a place vehicles are a place they also can be objects if there's someone moving them right versus a chair or a couch now we're going to get into forms story forms is something that john schultz the mighty introduced in its he didn't come up with forms he simply looked at literature back in the, the 60s or whenever, he and Betty Shiflet, and recognized not genres, but the actual story forms that are the storytelling modes, the forms that authors have always used. And so he just put terms to that. And you may be familiar with some of these terms, like essay, you know, but he distinguishes that from, let's say, the how-to, which the how-to is kind of part of a how it happens. And on the back, I have more of the, the models. So, how it happens. You've probably written this. You've give, Anytime you've given instructions to someone, or actually the instructions would be a how-to. But how it happens, it comes in all different shapes and forms. The how it happens would be, and it plays into model tellings, how it happens. Think of your routine in the morning. And you were going to tell someone that routine. And in story form, you'd be like, well... This is how it happens every morning for Brooke. He wakes up, he takes off his CPAP mask, he turns off his fan, he gets out of bed, you know, it gets clothes, whatever. And, and you could, I could walk you through my day. That's how it happens. How does it happen for your characters? What's the procedures when you get to work? What's the procedures when you get home? And so what's the procedures of your dogs of the day? So whatever, anytime you're going to sit down and write that, that's going to be a form of how it happens. Just recognize it's not a big deal. It's not groundbreaking, but it's about recognizing that form and what are, how do you bend or twist those things? How do you, typically you're going to set up a how it happens or a how to or model. The reason why I use these things is, well, Brooke, this is what he does when he wakes up, except this day, something else happened. And that's the purpose of how it happens, model telling. Model telling, I was kind of giving the Insula, I want to say, um, by Toni Morrison. There is a section where it talks, it's about, this is what all the girls in the high school do. This is what all the people in the town do. Oh, the oh, if you've ever watched the opening for Weeds, the television show, that is a model telling of the song, is a model telling. Little houses in the suburbs. And it's telling you what happens in these houses in the suburbs. That's a model telling. There's a very good one if you ever watched... Oh, no, I'm bl uh, blanking. The raccoon anime. <laughs> Tanuki anime. From Pom... Not... Pompoko. Yeah, Pompoko. The opening of that is a model telling of how in the 70s, 80s in Japan, they slowly wiped out the forestry... And started putting in the suburbs and the story is about raccoons trying to <laughs> revive their forests or tanukis. All right. Letter form journal. This would be your characters writing a letter, writing a journal. They could I, oh, there was some story that we read of an older book, like the seven novel of the seventeen, eighteen hundreds, where the the, the 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 section is the guy's actually writing a letter and as he's doing it he like fake cry or he, like, dips his finger in water and then, like, puts it on the page to make it look like he's crying, like a tear mark. But you're just, what would your character say in a journal? What would they say in a letter? And it could be combined with a story in a story inside the letter. You're telling a story inside the letter as a second person. 
a uh, storyteller or story and teller is simply characters talking to each other. You got clerks. Clerks is all story within a story. It's two clerks, Dante and Randall, just chatting with each other. Oh, and then other people come up and tell them stories, and we observe this within the story of the film. Kind of already covered dreams and what are dreamlike things. Dream mode, essay, some some sort of reporting, argumentative paper. We're all familiar because the college or school opposites. And if you want any more details on these, of course, go check out Writing from Start to Finish from John Schultz. Opposites. The example in here is of Bigger in Native Son, written by Richard Wright, where Bigger is very much written as a character that is more or less opposite, best best I understand it, uh, how Richard Wright would operate and what he goes and does. So you take what your normal character would be, or the protagonist, whatever your it's it's very much kind of your personal. Should I just read it out of here? Sorry, one moment. Folktale writing opposites one sixty five. I have a note here. I have a clip. The first unfortunate tendency of many writers is to make fun of the opposite from the other other side rather than identify with the person and see everything from his or her point of view. It's a cheap and often self-defeating way of maintaining your self-esteem. Obviously, however, there can be creative, perceptive, satire, or parody of opposites. If the writing is going to be funny, it will often emerge naturally in the writing. Write seriously in the opposite's language. That may be the best way to let the opposite make fun of himself or herself. In your How It Happens subject, so this is under the How It Happens section in the book. Uh, in your How It Happens subject, you can find several opposites. Take the ones that attract you most strongly. Also repel you, perhaps, and write about them. Someone you've known on a job, in school, in the neighborhood, in your family, wherever. Sometimes the more powerful opposites are those you fear, hate, admire, despise, or f feel to be dangerous. Or someone who is inept, awkward, never reads human signals correctly. Or someone who is magnetically compelling, a gain leader, an administrator, a union leader, a business executive, a linguistic opposite whose speech and background is different from yours. One to whom you may have listened a good deal. I should just read his book. I'll admit it. Folk tales are a fall underneath how it happens. Whereas folk tales are uh, always like come in threes. You got Goldilocks and three bears. You get one character doing something three different times, and you get different effects, possibly for each of them, or at least for the third, where she eats the porridge, and then she like goes and lays in the bed. She get, does the three beds, does the three porridges, and then the bears find her or whatever. Grim fairy tales, great example of folk tale, and there's and typically with folk tale within the form of it, you're usually pulled a little bit higher up. You could have it closer, but within the within the form, generally you're gonna have a farther back position as the author telling the story. Not quite as much as Genesis in the Bible, where it's like in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Or in John, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, the word was with God. And then slowly, at the beginning of Genesis and John, it's like we zoom in and psh, we land on Adam, or we zoom in and land on, at least in John, I don't think you start with the birth of Christ, that'd be Luke or Mark or uh, Matthew. We'd, we'd jump into ministry of John or Jesus, whichever. But in the folktale, you're definitely, you could have humans. It'd be more likely that you would have animals as characters very easily. I have my copy of Brothers Grimm is behind me. Typically, when it comes to teaching students uh, second grade on, we usually do a how-to. And the how-to in particular would be a good example. You want someone wants to tell how to make a how to how to fish. You find someone. Oh, when, how did you find out how to fish? Well, I was taught by my uncle or by my grandfather. Then okay, well tell me the story about how your uncle or grandfather did that. And over the process, the idea is through the story, the audience member could then go and should be able to, within reason, go learn how to fish. 
Oh, man, I love making cakes. I make cakes with my grandmother. Well, tell me a story about who your grandmother is and how you make cakes together. Okay, awesome. Moby Dick, How to Run a Line. That's the example you're going to find in John Schultz's book, which we read in class. And then there's more. Just a little bit more. So I wanted to just go into model telling, and this is all can happen. I gave the example of more or less a model character before of where do your characters come from? What's the usual thing that they, uh, the background of their town, or it could be the model character, what they do when they wake up, what's their, it could be their own model telling or the background of, Oh, this is how the soldiers are chained, uh, trained. This is, how we, and then it's like you break it with the character. Now we got a model of generally what happens with the with the collective. Now we're going to get a model of the individual and what sets them apart. Extended comparisons, longer metaphors, uh, summary. We're going to summary of okay. This is how we run. This is how we're going to run the fair this year. You get a summary. You might get a summary of events or. You get the summary of, all right, here's the heist. We got a heist. You're going to have a lot of models and a lot of models probably running with how you're going to do heist. You're going to have the model of like what sort of characters you're, you're going to have a lot of expectations of the audience and matching those and then um, then kind of jumping around and jumbling those expectations of the audience versus, and that's probably going to be done basically through the telling and you're going to be getting the summary, the extended comparisons or the character. So when I sit down to write a scene, this is just kind of where I start. And then for the stuff I've been doing, it's like, I don't know who my character is. I'm coming up with a character off the top of my head. I, until my character is about, he's, it's a dude that just wants to go to his laundry and he ends up getting sucked into another world or whatever. And ends up, he needs to save these different worlds. So in that process, I actually do have other characters from novel work that I end up introducing. I was like, oh, what would they be like in this kind of horror scenario authoritarian world? Well, you know, how could Chicago get even worse? Well, let me tell you, I've come, <laughs> I've imagined ways. And I made it, imagine it much worse. And how do my characters survive in that world? And getting to interact with them and subvert expectations, bend the genres around characters are good guys, are protagonists, now antagonists, or any of that sort of stuff. Are they opposites of what they are in the regular world? But typically, just ask who your characters are, fill this stuff in as need be, get the location, get a little bit of this, and then having, a, you know, having an awareness of what story form you're landing in and what are how to subvert some of those expectations that can be helpful. Like I said, I have characters who have very dreamlike abilities. And how do I do that without breaking the rule? How do I do that without breaking the story? You can have characters. Superman can very easily break stories because he's the he can fly. He's super strong. Like nothing can it's unless you get kryptonite, right? Or you have certain levels of magic. And there's 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 definitely something dreamlike of people of that power level, where there is a sense of the self fulfilling fantasy, um, of oh if I was Superman I would like stop whatever, and we get examples of how that works in Watchmen, and in Supreme if you've ever read Alan Moore Supreme. But I think that's all I got for today. Check out my Substack, greatly appreciate it. Post some stuff on Locals. Would love to read whatever work or ideas you got. And let's just have fun reading and writing. Have an awesome day. It is May. The weather will be getting better depending on what part of the world you're in. <laughs> Bye.